All right, so thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to talk about this topic to you. I'm very interested in APIs. I've been working for, in, with APIs for a very long time. And for the past few years, I've been working with companies trying to help them you know, design, build, and, and secure APIs. And something that I realized is that like, it doesn't apply in all contexts and to everybody, but we are not actually very good at threat modeling APIs. And part of the reason is, you know, when we're working on APIs, uh, it's usually it's a small part of a huge effort, right? And so we're delivering an application, and there's an API there. And, you know, as we approach the deadline to deliver the application, there is in the last minute we have to uh, make a last minute change. We need a new piece of functionality, we have to incorporate a new endpoint, or we have to add new parameters to a response to expose more data. And the deadline is coming close, so we just add these changes to the code, and we don't have time to threat model or uh, analyze the impact of these changes into our security posture. So, you know, looking at these things, and in the past year, looking uh, also at tons of public API specifications out there, uh, open APIs and GraphQL APIs, I realized there's a lot we can do actually from the design point of view to improve our security posture. So just looking at the, at the design, uh, the parameters we're exposing, the data we're exposing, the user flows, there's a lot, of, a lot of things we can do to analyze those things, test them, and make sure we are exposing safe user flows and safe APIs. And so that's, the, that's what this talk is all about. Um, before we jump into the details, let me introduce myself. My name is Jose. I'm the author of two books. The first of them is Microservice APIs. It was published in December 22. The second one, Secure APIs, is coming along the way. I'm actually writing chapter five as we speak, and, and th that chapter is all about security by design APIs. So I'm very excited to be talking about this topic now. Um, I have a website, learn.microapis.io, where I'm, I'm planning to upload courses. There's one course already on pre-sale, but I'm gonna keep uploading courses about API development and security, and I have a YouTube channel where I put tutorials about APIs and security as well. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, um, I'm in various platforms, uh, but really the best way would be on LinkedIn. So, um, and, and by the way, I forgot to say, um, if you want to grab a copy of any of the books, uh, I got a 45% discount code you see on, on the on the slides of so Peralta 2 OWASP. You can get a copy uh, at 45% 40, discount, but also I got 10 ebooks of secure APIs and five ebooks of Microservice APIs to give away for free. So if you want to participate in the giveaway, connect with me on LinkedIn or send, send me an email, just find me somewhere, tell me that you are connected with me through the OWASP conference and I'll include you in the giveaway. Um, and I'll put the slide at the end also so you, ha you have time to, uh, to copy it. Um, and this is a project that is coming along for a while. I've been working on this for a long time. So the idea, what I want to do is I want to help developers get better at threat modeling APIs and identifying vulnerabilities by interacting with APIs and also tracing those vulnerabilities down to the code. And so what I'm going to do with API threats uh, is going to be free participation. Every two weeks, we're going to have a new challenge. We're going to see a new API, and we're going to have to find the vulnerabilities. And the next week, we're going to find those vulnerabilities specifically in the code. We're going to see how we fix them. I'm going to run giveaways and things to encourage participation. Really, what I hope is that we all get better at API security. So the agenda for today, we're going to see briefly, first of all, why, uh, why API security matters. We're going to see an example of what vulnerable design is, uh, how we could exploit that uh, vulnerable design. Then we're going to see um, a whole catalog of um, design vulnerabilities that have been putting together over the past few months. We're going to see how we can exploit those vulnerabilities and how we tackle this problem at the scale with automation. So APS security is important because APS are now the main vector of attack on our systems. Um, most of the internet traffic is going through APIs. Depending on what you look at, uh, it's anywhere between 60 to 90 percent, even above 90 percent of all internet traffic. And this is important because APIs carry business functionality, they carry data, and if we are not good at protecting this functionality, people have unfettered access to major holes in our systems. So we really want to make sure we can protect those things. Um, but then it turns out API security is, dif is difficult, actually. It's very different from traditional web security. So if you look at uh, traditional web security frameworks like Ruby on Rails or Django, so when you're building a, uh, websites with those frameworks, they actually do a lot of heavy lifting. They, they go a long way to, to make sure that you're delivering 
fairly secure applications. They don't, do, they don't take care of everything, but they, they take care of CSRF tokens, sessions, cookies, and a lot of other things. And you don't even have to do anything to, to make sure those things are in place. With APIs, it's different. We have to put together our um, authentication and authorization flows. We have to determine what is the right authorization flow for our API. We have to put together the right data models, ensure data is validated correctly, validate tokens correctly, use the right tokens. And so good frameworks are going to give us the tools to put these things together, but then it's on us to, to make sure it is correctly articulated, and that's why it is difficult. So... Um, what I think we can do is, you know, by looking at the design of, of the APIs, we can do a lot of groundwork, of groundwork to make sure that our APIs are correctly uh, secure. And, and that's what, I, that's what, we, what we're going to talk about here. To give you an example of what vulnerable design looks like, here is um, a pagination pattern for a get products endpoint. So this is an endpoint that will give us a list of products. Imagine a catalog or something. And so here we have a, a few parameters that allow us to do pagination in a fairly standard way. We can select the number of items per page. We can select the page we want to look at, how we want to filter, and sort out the items. Now, this is a fairly standard pattern, but also a great example of vulnerable design. This is the intended usage. People tell us they want to have like 10 items per page. They want to look at page number one. Um, they want to filter by toasters or by, sort by reviews. That's the intended usage. But this, here's what could happen. So we look at the per page parameter. We know it's, um, and also one warning, uh, we're already into this. Um, I'm going to have to use some technical examples of open APIs and API terminology and such. I'm going to do my best to explain everything, but if something isn't clear, feel free to ask questions later in the Q&A or, or separate in the holes. Um, but it's inevitable. We are talking about design vulnerabilities here. So here's what could happen. We know per page is a non-required parameter in this API. We know it is an integer, and we don't have any further constraints here by design. So by design, if the implementation follows this, someone could come along and say, well, give me a million items per page. And surely one request, maybe it's okay, but if we have a dozen, a hundred, or a thousand, or a million requests like this, surely, surely it is going to put a lot of pressure on our database. And so something like this is already something we can start exploiting to abuse our system. Something like filter. It's non-required, it is a string, and it doesn't have any further, any further constraints either. So what we could do is we could come along and say, well, how about we filter by drop the table users? And now this is the classical example of SQL injection. It's not really going to work with most modern database systems, but we're going to see a few of the examples later that will actually work. And, and if we don't have any constraints, and if we're not parameterizing our queries, it's going to have a tremendous effect on our system. So the proposition of API security by design is that we can improve our API security posture. We can improve a lot of, we, we can um, fend off a lot of these issues by tackling security from the design stage. So before we build the APIs, the idea is we should, th we should get thinking about the kind of functionality we, we want to expose through the API and then reflect that functionality in a document that is the API uh, design. So that's, that's the, golden, the golden rule of API uh, security by design. We, you can't protect what you don't know. You need to have an accurate description of your API, and that's an API specification. Uh, if, it is an, if it is a REST API, that is an open API document. If it is a GraphQL, that is a schema. And having this document beforehand allows us to do some threat modeling on the API, allows us to run tests against the design before we will move on to the implementation and make sure we are articulating user flows in a way that is conduct conductive to security. So what I've been doing over the past uh, months is I've been looking at these uh, tons of API specifications and I've been putting together a catalog of design vulnerabilities that are commonly reflected in those APIs. And we're going to discuss some of those uh, vulnerabilities here. Um, I'm planning to include all of this information in a website, apivulnerabilities.com. It's not yet available, but it will be at some point. And so this information will be uh, in a lot of detail in that website. So to get it started, to warm up something simple, sequential IDs is the first category. We're all familiar with this. If we work with SQL databases, they are natively supported. They are very easy and to work with and very, very easy to reason about. And they are great for the database. The only problem is when we expose those identifiers directly through the API, then suddenly we have a predictable pattern that we can use to try and find resources on the API. So imagine we have a payments API, 
And so we make a payment and we get back the resource identifier. It is number one. We make another payment and it's number two. Another payment, it's number three. So suddenly we realize there is an, a predictable pattern to identify resources in this API. So someone may come along and say, well, what happens if I start playing around with this, these identifiers and if I try number 20, number 25, number 105? And, you know, if we have the right security controls in place, they will get something like um, not found, um, and you, you don't have access to these or something like that. But the, the problem is we are opening the door to um, the possibility that users gain information about the resources we have in place and they might get their hands on them. So what we want to do by design is we want to prevent that kind of thing. So as an example, what happened to Clubhouse, the, the popular social media platform, I don't know if it is popular anymore, but it was back then. So April 21, um, they had this uh, API endpoint to find users, and they had uh, this uh, predict uh, predictable identifier, numerical identifier. And so someone realized it was like this, and they, they were able to pull over a million users from the database using the API. Now this was uh, in the news, this was reflected as a data leak or data breach, but Clubhouse came along and said, well, no, no, it wasn't a data leak. This is how the API is supposed to be used. You know, it's open to anyone. We have this type of identifier by design. What I don't know if what's worse is to, to acknowledge that your API is vulnerable by design or that, or to own the problem and try to fix it. Um, they decided to, you know, say the, the API is vulnerable by design. Um, surely it shouldn't be like this, right? Uh, these resources shouldn't be easy to find in a predictable way, and no one should have unfettered access to those uh, resources. So it's a combination of vulnerabilities here. We have those predictable identifiers, but we also have the ability to scrape the whole content of the API without any restrictions. And so from the identifier point of view, what we would want to do is make sure that if we have sequential IDs in our database, those IDs are not directly reflected on the API, um, so we can use a hashing function or something like that to mask those values. And if we can, maybe we use a different type of identifier in the database, then we don't have to do this additional work of masking the value. But surely we don't want to expose predictable um, identifiers through the API. Now the next category is a little bit more complex, uh, is flexible schemas. And there are two flavors of these. So when we are exchanging data models in our API, we have data models to, to document those um, those objects. Um, so in, in OpenAPI we call them schemas, in GraphQL we call them types, and sometimes we have um, optional properties in those models or we have the ability to insert additional properties. So these are the two flavors of this um, vulnerability and we have, uh, you know, this opens the door to different kinds of attacks like mass assignment, broken object properties level authorization, data corruption, and some others. So the first flavor of this vulnerability is undeclared properties, unknown properties. So if you're familiar with OpenAPI, it is based on, on top of JSON schema. Um, the way JSON schema works is we can define a data model. So imagine we define a user model and it has things like username, email, date of birth, things like that. And so those are the documented properties, the known properties of the model. But the way JSON schema works, it doesn't prevent the presence of additional properties in the, um, in the model. So it would be perfectly fine to insert additional properties in those payloads. And that's how OpenAPI works. And if our implementation follows the same lines, then we are allowing the presence of those additional properties. To show you how this could be a problem, imagine we have an orders API. So we can place orders and we can get the details of an order by using the resource endpoint. So when we place an order, we send the product ID and the quantity that we want to get of that item. And that we place an order, then we get back the full resource identification uh, representation with the ID and the status of the order. Now, because we're not, so this could be the, 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 the schemas that represent both payloads. When we place an order, we have product and quantity. When we, re, when we retrieve the details of the order, in addition to those two, we have ID and status. Now these definitions like these don't prevent the, the presence of additional properties. And so someone could come along and say, well, I'm gonna place an order and I'm gonna set the status of the order already to paid. And maybe then afterwards I'm gonna update the status of the order to returns. Um, if you're familiar with Crappy, the deliberate, deliberate, the vul, deliberately vulnerable API uh, that OWASP maintains, this is a, uh, one of the vulnerabilities in the API, actually. You can change the, the status of the order 
To return, for example, you don't have to return the item, you just get the money back. So this is something that could happen, and, and so imagine in payments, uh, for example, if we are able to overwrite the status of a payment or something like that, something that people could abuse, uh, could exploit to abuse our business model. And so to prevent this from a design perspective, we have two ways of doing it. So in the schemas, we can use additional properties or unevaluated properties, and we can set them to false um, in, in OpenAPI. So depending on the version of OpenAPI, we'll use one or the other. Uh, so it looks like this. We have the place order model, and we set the, so we have the type of object, the required properties, the list of properties, and then we, uh, we specify that additional properties or un unevaluated properties are not allowed. And this is going to disable the ability to insert additional properties in the payload. And so if the implementation follows this guideline, then the API is going to be secure from that point of view. Um, one second. Right. Um, right. I want to show you also what a vulnerable implementation would look like as well. So uh, this is, you know, mass assignment is something that is going, is, is being, is been, has been around for a long time. So if you're familiar what happened in, I believe it, it was in 20, 2013 with GitHub. So GitHub was built with uh, Ruby on Rails. Uh, mass assignment was, was originally a feature of Ruby on Rails to facilitate uh, development work. So you get data from your users and you can populate the active record um, automatically with that data. And so uh, uh, a security researcher came around um, and, and to prove that this vulnerability was a problem, uh, he was able to bind his SSH key to the profile of a user with commit rights to GitHub. And that's when they thought, okay, we need to fix this on, on Ruby on Rails. Uh, but the thing is, this vulnerability can show up in any, in any language with any framework. So this is an example in Python. Uh, vulnerable to mass assignment. So what we're doing is we're fetching the request uh, payload from the JSON, we're iterating over the keys and values in that payload, and we're binding them directly to the database model, and then we save and return. Now, uh, if we combine this with the data models that we were looking at before, that expose, um, allow people to include additional properties in the, in the payloads, um, then we have the perfect recipe for uh, ad, ad mass assignments and all kinds of abuse in our system. Um, so that's one type of flexible schema. The other type of flexible schema we can have is with optional properties. So imagine we have um, a book review website. We can rate the book, and we, can, we have the option to include a written review as well, right? So that written review would be the optional properties. So we use this often to give flexibility to our users to decide what kind of data they are going to include in the request. Sometimes also to combine different models in the same uh, schema. So here, for example, um, a model for a book that represents two different types of books. We have ebooks and uh, printed books. And so they, they share a lot of properties in common, like title, author, format. And so we think, okay, because, the, because they share some properties in common, we're going to represent them with the same model, but we're going to have specific properties for each type, like pages and byte size, as optional. And so what could happen here is a user may come around and instead of sending the right um, request with expected data, they might send something corrupted. So we're going to send uh, data for a new book, but instead of including byte size, we're going to include pages. And if this goes all the way to the database, then when this is used in a different part of the system, when we're loading data, processing it, or displaying it on a UI, um, it, it's going to trigger some errors, and annoying errors that are going to be very difficult to trace and debug. So what we want to do in this case is we want to separate both the schemas, because we actually have two data types, right? So we want to have a printed book model and a new book model. We can have a base model that contains all the common properties, and then we use composition to um, to represent the two subtypes. But we want to make sure that each model contains the the properties that are specific to that model, and we put also additional properties in place to make sure that no one can set additional properties on these payloads. So that is uh, flexible models. Um, now we're going to look at the different uh, category, which is unbound parameters. And so this affects to this affects uh, parameters um, in in payloads, things like numbers, strings, arrays. It can affect also query parameters. Uh, so when these parameters don't have any constraints, they open the door for different kinds of attacks, like big integer attacks, large payload attacks, pagination, uh, pagination attacks, SQL injection attacks, and many more. 
So an example here is what we saw before with pagination. We already saw that we can have used the per page parameter to request millions of items per page. We can do this many times and put a huge burden on the database. Um, the filter, we saw this classic example of drop the, drop the table uses, but we can run some of those SQL injection attacks here that are actually, may actually work. If we don't have parameterization in the database, this may work. So we can say filter by close the quote mark or close the quote or 101 and, and comment the rest of the statement. So if we are not parameterizing our, our queries, this may come into place. It can have different kinds of consequences. So one of them is disabling uh, conditional access that we have for different users to different objects. So as a non-admin user, for example, I may not have the ability to see certain objects on the database. And by setting the filter to these, um, what we're saying is forget the filters, just return everything to, to the user. And so this would give uh, as a broken object level authorization in the API. Uh, we have, we can do this in other different ways. This uh, close to quote and 101, uh, this is the cl one, a classic example of SQL injection. We can do things more complicated like the one below. And we, get, we can do all the interesting things like resource starvation. So if we send a request selecting, we can, se we can still select a million items and we combine it with this filter that's going to say, Okay, now what you're going to do is sleep for 10 seconds. So load all this data in memory and sleep for 10 seconds. If this passes to the database, and we do it a few times, what we're going to do is we're going to load huge amounts of data, put them in memory. The database is going to be sleeping for 10 seconds, waiting to return this data. At some point, it's going to run out of resources and it's going to shut down. So these are ways we can exploit those parameters to abuse the system. Um, to give you another example, different from pagination, imagine we have a book review website and we, we can send, uh, we can uh, rate, rate books, right? So we can send a request saying uh, this book is five stars and we can optionally include a written review of the book. Now we get back the response and it tells us, um, among other things, it's going to tell us the ID of the resource and also the number of votes that the review has got. And so this is going to determine where the review shows up in uh, what we display on the UI, right? Now, we can abuse uh, this model. If, if the model is like this, like the book review model you see here, so we have the type, the required properties, the, it doesn't have any constraints, any restrictions. So somebody may come around and say, right, well, let's say I'm going to send a review and it's going to have 500 rating and it's going to have a million upvotes. So this review is going to show up all the way to the top but also it's gonna push the average rating. If we don't have any constraints, that would pass to the database and it would have that effect. But also I can do something interesting as well. So I'm the author of Secure APIs and there are a lot of books about API security as well. So let's say I want to make sure nobody can check the other books. Um, I don't want to give them visibility. So what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write an insanely large review with a massive payload. And if we don't have constraints on the database either, this is going to pass all the way through the API. It's going to be written to the database. And maybe one of these reviews is not going to be, is not going to do much harm. But if I do a bunch of those reviews, ultimately, when we try to load that record from the database, it's going to be very difficult. And eventually, the request is going to time out and nobody's going to be able to see that book that is a competition to me. Um, and this is, um, you know, I've seen variations of this type, so this type of vulnerability in, in different systems. So, uh, I've had APIs that are like data intensive applications for analytics, and we have, in some cases, large JSONs that are saved into one single cell. And we have a lot of those records saved to the database. Eventually, it's just impossible to load those records. So if we don't have those constraints in place in the database and the API to limit the size of the data, eventually we're gonna run into this kind of trouble. So what we want to do here to fix this problem, we want to look at the book review um, object and we want to put constraints in place. We want to make sure that the integer of the rating has a minimum and a maximum value. Nobody can put minus 50, for example, but equally nobody can say 500. Um, and the review property also has a limit. So it has a maximum limit of characters. The same we can do in the database as well to enforce this restriction. And we want to make sure also that the book review doesn't allow additional parameters. So up votes and things like that, we're not going to be able to manipulate them. Um, and so that's how we prevent this vulnerability. The, um, we put constraints in place and also, you know, uh, parameterizing database queries is never too bad.
Um, the next category I want to look at is exposing server-side properties in user input. So this is something I see very often in tons of APIs. Um, sometimes we reuse the same object to represent input and output, often for convenience because we don't want to have different models all over the place to represent different kinds of operations. The problem here is we're going to have server-side or read-only properties exposed in input. Uh, to give you an example, for example here, imagine we have a payments API. So we make a payment. The expected request is we're going to specify the amount, the currency, the merchant, the account of destination. And we're going to get back the resource of the, the representation of the payment, including the status and such. The problem is without any further restrictions, if we are sharing the same model for input and output, someone may come along and say, well, I'm going to send a payment. And because I have the same model for input and output, I'm going to send the status already. Uh, I'm going to have it. Uh, I'm going to set the status to send or settled or whatever is the final state of the payment. So I'm going to skip. Uh, I'm potentially I'm going to skip all the processing that is involved in verifying the payment. Um, and this is an example actually from an actual fintech API uh, that I had a chance to work with recently. The, the example is modified, but it's coming from the API. And so what we want to do here is. We want to split really input and output into different models. We want, we don't want to expose server side properties to user input. You know, what we're relying in this case is that we have a, a smart developer somewhere in the, uh, in the implementation who's going to say, well, okay, we're using the same model for input and output, but surely we're not going to use status of the payment, um, in, in the, in the payment process. We, uh, we're not going to allow users to set that property. Uh, but, you know, we may not have that smart developer in place. And if we're going to test the valid, if we're going to run API validation tools against the implementation, those tools will flag the fact that we are not complying with the specification. So we want to drive by design those constraints. We want to make sure we have a very strict model for I input and a different model for output. And that, um, so that's how we would prevent uh, that vulnerability. Now, um, the other thing I want to talk about is vulnerable user flows. So at the end of the day, you know, when you look at API breaches, most of them are a combination of multiple vulnerabilities coming into place at once. And, and that's usually in the context of user flows. So if you look at Imperva's state of API security report from this year, what they find is that uh, logic abuse accounts for the majority of API attacks, uh, about 30% of them. And this maps, if you're familiar with your WASP top 10 for APIs, this maps to category number six, and restricted access to business flows. And there are many different variations of these. Some examples from, from the news, if you tried to buy, for example, PlayStation 5 when it launched, you may have uh, found that it is constantly gone from most e-commerce websites. So that's an example of this vulnerability. Um, in the UK, when you have to, when you want to take a driving test, uh, you have to book it online. Uh, a recurrent problem for this has been the, you know, when the slots become available, they are gone the minute they become available. That's another example of this vulnerability. When Taylor Swift is going to do a concert, the moment the tickets become available, they're gone because there are bots uh, buying those tickets. And th that's another example of this vulnerability. In, in fact, uh, I kind of call it the Taylor Swift test for APIs. If you, if your API can pass, um, uh, this kind of test. But we have, really, there are other, other examples as well. So you can think of, um, a password reset test. So can people have unrestricted, unrestricted access to that, to that flow to the extent that they would be able to reset the password of other users by attempting to reset many times? Or do we have the right access controls in place to prevent that? Another example of this is what happened to Trello earlier this year in February. So Trello had this um, API that allowed you to find um, or connect with other people that you're not connected with. So you could find other profiles and connect with them. Uh, and you could do that by using the email. So you can send email to the API and they give you the corresponding user profile. Now the problem is, in combination with that, it would, they, they were giving you a lot of other data about the user as well, a lot of personal data, data that you could use for phishing attacks and other strategies, to, so putting users at risk. And so this is a combination of various problems here. This is a user flow, right? We are designing a user flow for convenience that we can find other users by using an email and we can connect with them. Uh, the problem is this wasn't authenticated, it wasn't rate limited, and we were exposing too much data in this, in, in this endpoint. 
So this is an ex you know it's an example where we are we're combining multiple vul vulnerabilities to create a vulnerable flow. And one of the things is we, we expose these flows for convenience, right? Um, we want to make it easy to find and connect with other users, but and intentionally we are we are also exposing vulnerabilities. So what can we do to prevent this kind of vulnerable user flows? And one of the things I, I recommend is to break down the flow into multiple steps. So this ability to connect with other users on, on Trello, for example, we could break it down into a few different steps so that uh, it becomes a multi-step flow to find another user. A second thing you want to do is require authentication. So you don't want to have these vulnerable user flows exposed to anyone. You want to make sure it is a specific identity that is performing those actions so that you can trace that identity and their actions and, and you can block them if, they're, uh, if you can see signs of suspicious activity. You also want to make sure you're tracking IPs, origins, um, or origin of the request so that you can do some uh, threat detection. You can run some threat detection in your system against those vulnerable user flows and be able to prevent it. You want to prevent uh, scraping also. So what we, what we saw for Clubhouse, we don't want to allow people to scrape our whole database of uh, users, products, or items. We want to make sure that people can only go so far in that process. And something you can use to work with this idea of modeling uh, workflows, so there is a, a new specification. In, um, it was launched this year, actually, recently. So the workflow specification is being um, sponsored by the OpenAPI um, Foundation. And so the first release is called, I think, Aretto, something like that. And so what we can do with this is we can document our API flows. This is incredibly useful even for developer experience. So imagine you're looking at the GitHub API. It's a massive API, tons of endpoints. The question is always, how, how do I use this for pr practical purposes? How do I raise a pull request? How do I, what are the flows here? So you can, you can document those steps with the workflow specification, and then you can use those flows to run threat modeling through them. So are those flows, ac flows accurately protected? Can we trace specific identities through those flows? Are all the parameters sufficiently constrained? Are we exposing um, the minimum amount of, the, of data that is necessary in every step of the flow? So that's, those are some things we can do. Now, in most cases, what we have is tons of APIs already deployed and running out there. Um, so the question is, how do we, you know, every organization has at least dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of APIs. So how can we run those, those tests at a scale? So we need tools. And there are two types, two types of testing we can do here. We can test at design time and we can test at runtime. So at design time is going to be looking at the design of the API. At runtime is going to be with a running server. Uh, checking against the API specification, running tests against the API. So I want to show you uh, three tools, Schema Thesis, Fansa, and Spectral. Schema Thesis is for what we might call contract testing. Um, it's a fast, it's a fast uh, testing tool, actually. It's, it's running, it's looking at the API specification and validating the implementation by generating random payloads and test cases, but always with the idea of making sure that the implementation is accurate according to the design. And then uh, FENSA is a, a security specific and a Spectral is going to look at the design. So to run a schema thesis is a Python, it's Python package. So pip install a schema thesis. We run it with this command and we can, we can do things like um, use links. So links is a concept in OpenAPI um, to link resources. So we can say with this post endpoint, I create a, a resource. We're going to, we're going to get back an ID that I can replace in other URLs to find the resource. That's the basic concept. And so we, we run that and it's gonna do something like this. It's gonna go endpoint by endpoint. It's gonna run hundreds of tests. And if we have links, it's gonna go through the related resources and it's gonna test them as well. It's gonna, val gonna validate that the resources are correctly created. We can perform the right actions in, actions in them. And it's, and it's gonna flag any discrepancy between the implementation and the design. And so the great thing about this is if we have good design in place, then it's going to help us validate that the implementation is secure according to that design. Um, Fensa is a tool that I've been developing for a while myself. Uh, it's been quite developing um, recently, uh, but the idea is to have a place, um, you know, a, a, an open source space where we can talk about API security um, and advance uh, issues in this area. 
So another Python package, so pip install Fensa, run it against the base URL, give it an API specification, and it's going to go again endpoint by endpoint looking for, vul for vulner vulnerabilities in those endpoints. Um, Spectral is a Node.js package, so uh, with no, uh, npm install uh, Spectral, uh, and then uh, Spectral is actually a linter, so it's designed to enforce guidelines in, in the API design, but it's got a plugin called OWASP role set that is going to allow us to look for vulnerabilities in the design of the API. It doesn't cover absolutely everything we could be looking at, certainly not all the kinds of vulnerabilities that I've been discussing in this presentation, but it does cover a, a good amount of ground and it's, you know, it's better than nothing. So if we install this and we run it against an API, we're going to get something like this. So this is one of the best APIs I've, I've seen. This has, um, has like nearly 300 problems in the API. The situation is more like this. If you run this against public APIs, you're going to get something like this. From hundreds to thousands of problems in, in APIs across the board. And these are fintech APIs. They are insurance APIs. They are, um, GitHub is also here. Banking APIs. And so these are the kinds of APIs where we wouldn't want to have these kinds of vulnerabilities in place. Because, you know, if, Remember the idea, if we're implementing according to the API design, then the implementation is also vulnerable. So we want to drive security from the design to have all things, you know, um, secure from the beginning. Um, these are examples of running uh, Spectral against all the API APIs. So NatWest, Plate, GitHub. The bigger the API, the more uh, problems we will have. Um, so. Um, that's pre that pretty much wraps up the, uh, the talk. Um, just want to give you some resources that um, I've created in the past few months about these topics. So I've run a few webinars. Um, you will get access to the slides at some point. So some webinars I've done with Smart Bear on API security. Um, if you're interested in checking um, the latest news on the major API breaches, Firetail is, um, is, um, is an API security vendor. They track all the major breaches that are, as they happen, so you can come here and you see what's going on in this space. Uh, more examples, you will get them from HackerOne, um, brilliant website for bank, bank hunting and, and whatnot. Um, some examples here you can see later. Uh, and that's everything. Thank you for listening. Um, and let me go back to the beginning of the slides where you can see the, uh, the code for the book. And don't forget to connect with me and send me, a, tell me that you're connecting from a WASP conference to see, uh, to participate in the giveaway. Uh, so remember, I have 10 giveaways for secure APIs and five giveaways for uh, eBooks for microservice APIs. Um, I hope you get, get one, and that's all, and thank you. Thanks for the great presentation. So uh, questions are open, so if you have a question, feel free to jump in and ask your question. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. You mentioned a couple of uh, tools for API testing. Can they be used if the API doesn't have the open API specifications? The API has been developed over time. Without any specification, can, can no, be? no, I'm afraid no. So uh, this is a problem. Actually, uh, I talk with you know a lot of companies, and they uh, everybody's worried about API security, right? And uh, I understand we have APIs from legacy, you know, from many years ago. We we were not even in the habit of documenting APIs, and so they and, and they ask, can we test this? Can we uh, evaluate the security posture? But it's not really possible to do this kind of analysis if we don't have the spec. What we can do, um, so I had a chat uh, recently, uh, Prabhu Subramanian, I think is the name. So he has appthreats.com. He's working on a tool that can look at your code and try to generate specifications from the code. So by using something like this, you have a start. Uh, you know, the good thing about this is once you have some specification in place, you can run it against the implementation. You can see how accurate it gets. Um, and Escape, um, another API security vendor, um, they have this tool that can try to map your attack surface by just providing the domain. And there are a few other tools in, in this space. Uh, there are tools that can try to reconstruct your API by just looking at the traffic. Akita, for example, is one of them. So I would use one of these tools first, try to get an API specification. Even if it is not accurate, we can run it against the, uh, against the server using a schema thesis or some of the fast testers. And then we can get an idea of how accurate it is. 
And then we can start testing the security of that API design. That, that's the approach, the approach I would follow. Okay, thank you. What was the name of the tool that generates API specification from the code? Yeah, so let me go to the, to the slide. It's spectral for design testing and schema thesis for, um, for uh, contract testing and then Fencer for security now, testing. Which tool you mentioned to generate uh, a specification from the code? Oh, that is um, Atom. Atom. Uh, to generate the specification from, from code is Atom, from appthreats.com. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. It sort of follows on from that, is API discovery. So you have the design, and we all yeah. know what design is, it drifts away from the code. <laughs> so the time you get to your runtime, you're going to have other APIs that someone forgot to document. So what's the, what's the approach for API discovery? Right, so, um, so I, I guess there are the two approaches that we were mentioning before, right? So we can, we can, maybe we can use tools that look at the codes and they can um, give you a specification from that. And there are tools that look at the traffic and they, and they can build an API specification from that. They can give you the tag surface. Um, I guess the, the complexity is in some cases we, we have just platforms where anyone can deploy an API. And so if we don't have control of, over the, the endpoints that we are exposing, we, and we can do things like that, you know, we can use API gateways, um, things like Cloud Armor in GCP. Every cloud has its own way of uh, giving you tools to, to constrain the, the, the endpoints that are going to be exposed. But if we, don't have those, if we don't have those things in place, I think what we want to look at is at the traffic all the traffic that is incoming to the platform and map that traffic to the surface attack that we have in place. Yeah, okay. I, I take what you've got is secure by design perfect. Yeah. A lot of we have legacy code Yeah. That before security, <laughs> um, and it's still there. Yeah. So it's a case of trying to work out where that vulnerability, you know, how, how much rework we need to do because we can't rework all of it, so it's trying to identify. Yeah, and a lot of the time what happens is we are, we are releasing a new version of the API and forget to, to, to retire to the previous, <laughs> so yes. it's still there uh, with all the vulnerabilities and, and everything. Um, and so, like, I think watch, watching at the traffic is always good to see what we have exposed, and tools like Akita, for example, like I mentioned, they, they will be able, uh, Akita is not part of Postman, so maybe it's been renamed, I'm not sure. They will be able to get you the attack surface from that. Uh, but, and then once we have, you know, we have the attack surface, then we just need the payloads. From that, we can already start running design tests against the API and improving the, the security posture. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, Jose, thanks for the presentation. I don't think uh, we have any more questions. So, uh, last round of applause. Awesome, thank you.